Okay, sorry for the echo over there. Apparently, I needed to uh, switch off the YouTube screen, which I have done now. Um, so let me start again formally. Welcome everybody to the Anjun Ghosh Memorial Seminar titled, Can the Civil Liberties Be Defended in India? As we know, several recent events have raised difficult questions about the efficacy of the legal process in India to protect the constitutionally guaranteed liberties of citizens. In particular, the shocking death of Father Stan Swamy in judicial custody has revealed once again the callous disregard of investigative agencies and prosecution lawyers for the rights of the accused and the inhuman treatment of those held in prisons. Even more chilling is the inability of the courts to grant bail to the accused in the face of laws that prevent judges from examining the prima facie evidence and virtually dictate that the accused must be presumed guilty until proven innocent in a trial. In the process, scores, possibly hundreds of people, are being held in detention without trial for years at a stretch. The question this seminar seeks to raise are, do we have remedies? Is public criticism in the better informed media enough? Are there possibilities of reform from within the judicial system? Can there be effective political mobilization on these issues? These indicate the range of questions that we hope to raise and examine in this discussion. So I wanted to start the seminar also after sort of outlining uh, some of the basic concepts that uh, uh, lie behind the thinking uh, in choosing uh, this particular topic for the seminar, um, with a brief introduction to both the man and the seminars uh, uh, that we have held annually in his memory, the man, our colleague, uh, 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 Anjun Ghosh, and, and a little bit about the seminars that we've held ha annually in his memory since 2011. Now, I will, I will try and keep this as brief as possible because I, I don't want to run out of time towards the end. As many of you know already, Anjun Da, as we called him, joined the CSSC in 1985 and was with us till May 2010 when he was diagnosed with acute leukemia. The utter shock of his passing on 5th June that year cannot be forgotten. From the next year onward, the then director, Taputi Gohotakurta, initiated and organized a memorial seminar in his name at the center, which we held annually every year. These were, of course, at the time, physical events. The last such event was held on July 12th, 2019, and it was organized as a panel discussion around the then forthcoming volume, After the Revolution, Essays in Memory of Anjan Ghosh. This was subsequently published by Odeon Black Swan in 2020. The pandemic made us miss a year last year, but we decided to come back with a virtual event this year. This, therefore, is the 10th Anjan Ghosh Memorial Seminar. I must take the opportunity here to thank Taputi Ghothakurta, Partho Chatterjee, Doipan Bhattacharya, and of course, above all, Anjan Da's wife, Sheta Ghosh, for helping organize today's event. Thanks also to Jigisha Bhattacharya, our former student, for contributing the image for the poster that's gone out to all of you. Anjan Ghosh studied English at St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, before going on to complete his MA and MPhil from JNU in 1976. He taught at IIT Delhi for a couple of years, and while in Delhi, was closely associated with the PUDR, People's Union for Democratic Rights, joining the APDR, Association for the Protection of Democratic Rights, after he returned to Calcutta. He joined the faculty at the IIM Calcutta and taught there from 1980 to 1984. His PhD dissertation at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor under Nick Dirks was on rumor and communal riots in South Asia, 1946 to 1992. He co-edited History in the Present, a CSSC conference volume with Partho Chatterjee in 2002, and he was a regular contributor to the EPW, Seminar, and Frontier, and also to Unno Ortho, the social science journal in Bengali. Anjan Ghosh's early work was on the coal mine workers of the Dhanbad region, and we will start today's program with a short film of an interview with him on the subject by Poranjay Ghothakutta, who will briefly introduce it to you before we start. Now, before he introduces the film uh, for you, I will sort of briefly introduce uh, uh, Poranjay Da, though again, I'm sure he needs no introduction. Poranjay Guhutakutta's professional career started in June 1977 as a print journalist. His work experience spanning more than four decades cuts across different media. The written word 
spoken word and the audio visual medium printed publications and websites radio and podcasts television and documentary cinema he is a writer speaker anchor interviewer teacher analyst commentator publisher producer director and consultant much of his work is in three languages english bengali which is his mother tongue and hindi he has published and been published in other languages as well his main areas of interest are the working of the political economy and the media in india and the world on which he has authored co-authored books and directed produced documentary films in particular he examines the allocation and pricing of natural resources and the working of crony capitalism and oligarchies in india he teaches and speaks on these subjects to students general audiences and also trains aspiring and working media professionals he participates frequently of course in seminars and conferences and we are very grateful uh, to him today for the wonderful contribution that he is making to today's seminar over to you poranjada if you could just say a few sentences on the film and then uh, uh, when you direct me i will uh, begin to play the film uh, on your command are you i know that you are here i i i hope you can yes. hear me am i audible yes. yes we can hear you yes thank you so much dr rosinka choudhury thank you very much i see many friends and and well wishers acquaintances comrades in this gathering uh it's it's my honor and my privilege to be here this recording of onjunda was made in 2006 and the film was completed that year and after he passed away i had been meaning to put together this my interview with him as a tribute to him i finally managed to do it uh just a short while ago a few days ago uh, it will speak for itself it will talk about uh, uh onjunda's deep interest in in labor in in the in what was happening in the coal mining region of dhanbad and therefore uh, since the film will speak for itself uh, it i i don't need to uh, say anything more uh, i i am uh, i mean i'll be happy to answer any questions if any of you have after you view the film uh, contrary to uh, what has been mentioned in the uh, poster it's not actually a clip it's it's 20 minutes long so uh, uh the film will um, uh, please, you can please start uh, uh, the film uh, dr rosinka choudhury i unfortunately will have to leave at about 5 o'clock and i am happy that this uh, program is being recorded because then i will get an opportunity to uh, listen to what i've missed uh, later this evening thank you once again Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm now sharing screen so that you can see. Um... My screen, hopefully. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Sorry. Screen, dekha jaate? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Let me start playing it then. स्क्रीन रोसिंग का सॉरी तो मेरी फुल स्क्रीन या फुल स्क्रीन दे यू आर नो दैट वाज फुल स्क्रीन सॉरी इज दैट बेटर यस press the square button at the on the right hand corner press the square button in the right hand corner press the rosinka press the the square button on the right hand corner i have done that coming from the neighboring village uh, neighboring rosinka right hand corner of the small screen for tribals Adivasi Sorry, should I just Deva. pause this then? And, uh, ah, it's possible. Right hand mm-hmm. corner of the small screen. Right yeah, hand corner. Right hand corner. Where you paused it, that's a small screen. Go yeah. To the bottom right. Yes, that's right. the one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All done now. Can I resume? Yes. 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 You Let's can begin, begin from the beginning, now. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Go back again. Okay. Great. So here we are. Yeah. 
I don't know, it's not playing on mine. Madam, the voice is not audible. Yeah, yeah, the voice is not audible, madam. Please kindly do the read for me. Sound was dead and the sound went away. So we'll have to begin again. So I'm being told uh, on the phone that my Wi-Fi connection is too slow for this to be played on the full full screen. So I will need to reduce the size of the screen if that's all right. Um, is is this how is this would this be better? The, uh, the, uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah. So I'm yes, playing. Can this. See. Yeah, I'm playing this. Just we we shall just check it for sound again. From the neighbor. Going back a bit. Is that better? It's fine now. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think you have to keep your uh, audio on because it's we can't hear it otherwise. It, it was the local labor, people coming from the neighboring villages, neighboring areas, mainly comprising of um, tribals, Adivasi labor, and um, lower caste groups like Maoris um, who came to work in the collieries. And uh, basically, they were the people who cut the pits. You know, they, they dug the pits and they also worked underground um, as a family team most of the time, especially the Adivasi labor. The second phase comes with certain kinds of technological innovations. And that is once underground mining, you know, uh, becomes, uh, becomes the norm, and uh, people have to go underground um, uh, uh, and uh, in the carriage, and 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 they have to they have to sort of cut through the seam. You know, that is when they require specific kinds of technology. Like sometimes they use blasting, sometimes they use coal cutters, machine coal cutters. That is when there is a change in the in the labor force and uh, uh, upcountry labor mainly coming from north bihar and eastern UP. you know these people uh, begin to come in to work as slightly more skilled workers and the third phase is after nationalization you know after nationalization in 1971 when you have a large scale sort of uh, eviction of the Adivasi uh, workers and replacement by uh, sometimes by um, uh, by upcountry again uh, North Bihar and uh, sort of Eastern UP people coming in to work. Also, uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, sort of uh, people from. Um, from mafia gangs, you know, who were working as watch and war staff, people who, who used to sort of um, act as kind of um, the, the hooligans of the, of the colliery owners, you know, to maintain uh, law and order to sort of uh, dominate the workers. Some of them be become enrolled as workers, although they don't actually do the work underground. Charya is a very interesting case. It's an interesting case because uh, Charya had one of the largest deposits of coking coal. Coking coal is um, uh, is uh, very scarce in our country. I mean, the kind of coking coal that uh, Charya had. Uh, is very scarce in our country, and consequently, it is pretty high value sort of, um, uh, coal. Now, 
that kind of coal had to be mined at a great depth. And consequently, you know, the labor had to be sort of disciplined and controlled. Now, there were various mechanisms of discipline and control. These were used. For instance, you know, um, there was a whole system of operations which was utilized uh, during the Second World War in order to increase production for the war effort. You know, and that was um, uh, that was uh, through the introduction of what was known as CRO labor. CRO is um, several, uh, uh, coal fields recruiting organization, uh, which had its uh, head headquarters or the main depot in Gorakhpur, and uh, this this was uh, sort of universally known as Gorakhpuri labor. Now, this Gorakhpuri labor were kind of bonded labor they were herded in and they were not allowed free uh, free freedom to sort of uh, you know mix with the other laborers they were segregated in a, in a way and they were used as a kind of um, you know um, sort of black legs in, 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 a, in a sense they were used as black legs in order to break the norms of um, of uh, work uh, work uh, break the norms of production let us say you know and increase production at a very rapid rate now that was one kind of disciplinary uh, kind of formation which was utilized in 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 the in the 40s and it get continued till well into um, into the um, uh, 60s and, and 70s when uh, the mines were nationalized. Second thing is uh, there were hoodlums who were used as um, as the sort of strongmen of uh, colliery owners, mm. and they would uh, sort of double up as moneylenders and, and and hoodlums, and they they would sort of constantly keep a watch and control over the, the workers. And thirdly, there was the wage system, you know, through which, you know, control was maintained. That is, there were what were known as peace rated workers, and there were the permanent workers. Now, permanent workers is a kind of a category, which actually comes into force after nationalization. Before that, there is very little of permanent workers. They were mostly sort of workers casual workers who came in work seasonally went off and uh, came back to sort of uh, work at their, um, at their leisure. sort of you know they they, they were uh, they were not sort of uh, they were not uh, controlled in in, uh, in that kind of a strict fashion although the colliery managers tried to control them very strictly, but because of the intensity of work and the kind of arduousness of, of work, it was uh, practically impossible to get them to work all the time. This paradox is prevalent in all the places where you will find natural sort of uh, deposits or mineral deposits you know the entire jharkhand which has a very rich sort of uh, mineral deposit under the ground you know has overground its its population are very impoverished and destitute now why is this so the question is very simple extractive industries require particular kinds of labor uh, the people who are residents of uh, local residents, the Adivasis, you know, they are mainly employed, if at all, at the lowest rung of the work hierarchy. They work as unskilled labor most of the time. They're mostly uneducated and consequently cannot climb up the scale into the skilled category. The skilled laborers are mostly from outside. As a result, the, the local population is denuded 
of the wealth that uh, lies under the ground in different ways. Firstly, because of the extraction, there is a, a drain of the mineral wealth. Secondly, because of the sort of, uh, you know, lower grade work that they do, you know, they get pittance for a wage and often are even denied that pittance for various reasons, for indebtedness, for drinking, or for various other uh, reasons. Thirdly, there is another thing that uh, needs to be uh, understood, and that is, you see, the, these, these people uh, are never trained or skilled uh, enough to take up um, sort of high level positions. So there is the wages also are um, sort of uh, very low for the unskilled workers. The other reason is that because of mining, you know, the, the, the cultivable land undergoes deterioration because the surface moisture is drained away. You know, it, it sort of drains away into the cavities that are created by mining. And because of that, the, the fertility of the soil, topsoil, becomes very low and uh, agricultural production suffers considerably. So you have all these three reasons why the people of the locality, you know, the Adivasis mostly, who on whose land these natural uh, sort of deposits or mineral deposits are available, you know, they are the worst sufferers. You know, BP Sina, um, is part of the old Congress um, sort of uh, organization in in Bihar. Uh, he was at one time uh, associate of K. B. Sahai, you know, who was the uh, chief minister of Bihar, and who in fact tried to implement land reforms to an extent, which he didn't succeed entirely, but he, he did try. B. P. Sina. Uh, was part of this kind of a relatively progressive uh, sort of congressman in, in Bihar. But over time, what happened is that he carved out his niche and empire in the coal fields. And he set himself up as a, as a huge sort of political leader in this, uh, in this part of the world. And his style was... Um, very much part of a, a kind of a aristocratic style. You know, his, his, his house, his home was called the White House, you know, and he had this palatial and well-guarded and uh, uh, mansion, you know, uh, which was called the White House. And um, the irony of it all is that he was killed just uh, um, in, on the footsteps of, of the White House. Uh, that's, that's how uh, we came to know about uh, the White House. Surajdeo Singh is, of course, B.P. Singh, Singh's uh, sort of uh, successor, his right-hand man, person whom he groomed, uh, actually. But Surajdeo Singh does not form part of the um, the elite circles of the Congress leadership. You know, he came from the ranks, he was a labor contractor, and uh, because he was from the labor contractor, although he learned the ropes, he didn't have the cultural elan of uh, B.P. Sena. You know, so, uh, so when Suresh Deo Singh came to dominate the field after B.P. Singh's death, you know, he 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 was uh, far more of a of a predator rather than uh, rather than operator like uh, BBC. AK Rai has now become a lonely pilgrim, literally because he he has. Uh, 
he has been an exemplary figure in the labor movement. I mean, nobody can question his integrity. Nobody can question his devotion and his sort of total sort of dedicatedness to the cause of labor in, in the collieries. But you see, the collieries have now become a kind of a bottomless pit. You know, it's, it's a bottomless pit. I mean, one of the persons uh, in um, Charya Coalfield once mentioned to me uh, in passing that, you know, the culture of the coal fields has become covered with coal dust. It's become black, you know, and by that, what he meant was that in Dhanbad, the amount of uh, cash that is available for uh, expenditure and display is just completely disproportionate to the situation surrounding Dhanbad town. I mean, you know, most of the people around the Dhanbad town, the Adivasis who have been displaced by the uh, setting up of the BCCL headquarters, you know, all these people, they've, they've become destitutes over, over time. Whereas the wealth in, in Dhanbad is unimaginable. You know, that's, that's part of the story where I'm trying to locate uh, A.K. Roy because A.K. Roy functions within that kind of a situation and he functions with exemplary dedication. You know, he has been sort of uh, working for the cause of the colliery workers for well now three decades, if not more, you know. And when he first came in as an engineer, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was just an educated um, engineer uh, with, a, with, a, with a certain kind of a political uh, sort of uh, ideas. Now he translated that into an organization. He set up an organization, worked with um, Shibu Soren for some time before they parted ways. And then he, he went into electoral politics. He was elected MP from uh, Dhanbad for three terms. But once the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the post-nationalization sort of culture of corruption sort of got embedded into Dhanbad, uh, Ekira couldn't, couldn't sort of uh, cope with the kind of uh, pressures that were uh, put on the labor movement. I mean, he remained a leader. He still has a very strong and solid base. But um, you see, along with the workers, now the composition of the workers have undergone a change with open caste mining with uh, mechanized mining uh, coming very much to the forefront. And those kind of workers are not always uh, uh, fighting alongside uh, AK Royal. You know, if you don't have a dream, you don't, um, you, you, you cannot function in this kind of uh, a situation, which is otherwise extremely sort of impoverished and uh, extremely sort of, uh, corrupt. Now, within that kind of a situation, it is precisely because of his political ideals and his ideology that he's maintained his, uh, his integrity and his, uh, his sort of uh, mobilizational sort of um, uh, impact. But in, in terms of translating his work into real politics, that is where he has not been able to come good. And that is where, uh, you know, people can talk that he's not a pragmatic politician, but he never went into politics because of pragmatic reasons. I mean, he went into politics for ideals. I mean, he went into politics for the workers' cause. And that is a cause which is now increasingly sort of um, being pushed to the background.
to I'm sorry, how does one come out of this? Um, Stop share screen. Stop screen share. No, you're fine. Yeah. Um, so we shall uh, move on then to the next part of today's um, event, where we, we have invited three speakers to reflect on the concerns that I outlined earlier. Um, we are very grateful to them for making the time. And I shall introduce each of them as they begin uh, to speak. Um, we shall begin with uh, Jad Rez, uh, continue on to Kalpana Kannabiran, and then end with Alok Rai, if that's all right with the speakers. Um, so Jad Rez sent me just a couple of lines uh, about himself uh, to introduce him with. Um, Jean Drez is development economist, currently visiting professor at Rachi University. His recent books include An Uncertain Glory, India and Its Contradictions with Omurta Shen and Sense and Solidarity, Jholawala Economics for Everyone. Jean is also active in various campaigns for economic and social rights. So a very warm welcome to you, uh, Jean. If you can just um, unmute yourself, uh, switch on your video yes. if possible. And yes, uh, there you go. Yes. I am unmuted, yeah. Thank you, Rodinka. Please. Should I start? Okay, I'll start. Well, uh, <clears throat> so the, the topic of today's discussion is can the law defend civil liberties in India? Uh, I have no special competence on this topic. I was persuaded to join the discussion because I was told that the topic was partly inspired by what happened recently to Stan Swami, who was a dear friend of mine. And indeed, Stan Swami's case is extremely important, both, both as a symbol of the injustice that is being done today to under trials in particular, and also to many others through violations of civil liberties, and it's also very important as a warning of what, what may be coming in the near future. So I will say a few things about Stan. Uh, before that, I should try to comment on the question that has been posed. And before that, I would like to uh, express my appreciation of Anjan Ghosh and his work. I have a very bad memory, but I have a very clear memory of meeting Anjan Ghosh in Calcutta many years ago. It was at a kind of picnic organized by uh, CSSS. And uh, I remember the discussion I had with him. I don't remember what we discussed, but I remember the encounter and how I was, how I was immediately drawn to him and his warmth. And therefore, when I read Partha Chatterjee's wonderful obituary of Anjan Ghosh in EPW published in 2010, I could immediately relate to one statement made in that obituary, which is that Anjan was invariably the first person to befriend newcomers who came to CSSS. That's exactly what happened to me. And by the way, I really recommend that obituary to those who have not read it already. There's another sentence in that obituary that struck me when I read it. Uh, Partho said, of all the people I have known, he was probably the one who was most, sorry, he was probably the one who most assiduously insisted on matching his devotion to a life of the mind with a daily involvement in the rough and tumble of the political and social world. So I regard Anjan Ghosh as a kind of uh, Jolawala sociologist, not in the disparaging sense of the term Jolawala that is often used in the corporate sponsored media, but in the positive sense that for him, understanding and changing the world were complementary activities. And indeed one can sense that commitment in the interview that we have just seen. And even the fact that he took interest in the coal workers of Jharkhand, I think is quite significant. Uh, the coal sector in Jharkhand is an enormous uh, sector involving uh, thousands, if not tens or lakhs of thousands of crores of expenditure uh, over the years. 
uh, enormous crime and corruption and environmental destruction. And uh, finally, uh, very few people are studying this and especially very few economists. So uh, it's a kind of black hole, if I can use that expression uh, in Jharkhand, it's quite uh, good that people like Anjan actually look into this black hole and try to understand what is going on there. Uh, coming to the uh, topic of the discussion, the question that was posed is, can the law defend civil liberties in India? I think that I misunderstood the question a little bit because from what uh, Rosinka said at the beginning, I think what she is hoping is that we will say how the law could defend civil liberties, how things can change so that uh, civil liberties are better protected. I thought that we were asked to comment about why it is failing in that respect today. Uh, so that's what I will comment on briefly, but hopefully understanding why things are failing today will help us to discuss how things can move forward. The fact that the law is failing today to defend civil liberties, I think that is not in doubt. I mean, the facts are there in plain view uh, in the form of uh, huge numbers of under trials, for example, languishing in jail for years without trial, uh, without even knowing what is happening to their trial, uh, spending, uh, uh, ruining their families in uh, uh, expenditure on uh, lawyers who exploit them. And then by the time they come out, if they do, uh, being basically ruined. Then of course, there's torture in many parts of the country. There are fake encounters. So obviously something is not working. And uh, I think basically there are four layers of problems in increasing uh, order of uh, difficulty. The first layer, which I think is reasonably well understood, is that the law gives, many laws give excessive powers to the state, excessive legal powers. Uh, we have a whole series of laws like AFSPA, uh, UAPA, the sedition uh, provision in the IPC, and then many state laws like the Chhattisgarh Special Public Security Act, the Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Public Safety Act and so on and so forth. And all these laws give extraordinary powers to the state and in particular to the uh, police and armed forces. Um, and the counterpart of that is that we do not have enough constructive laws that actually protect civil liberties. For instance, India still doesn't have, to the best of my knowledge, a Prevention of Torture Act, which is quite extraordinary because India did sign the uh, UN Convention Against Torture and one would hope that there's no reason to oppose the Prevention of Torture Act, but there seems to be great resistance. And uh, that presumably reflects the fact that there are a lot of people in positions of power who think that without the use of torture, uh, it's not possible to uh, look after law and order. The second problem is that these laws are bad enough, but on top of that, they can be easily abused, they can be misinterpreted because there are so many, there's so much scope for interpretation. Uh, for example, in the UAPA, the term unlawful activities is defined in a broad manner, which includes, for example, any action which causes or is intended to cause disaffection against India. Now, what is disaffection against India? It's not even defined in that act. Uh, in other places, it's uh, defined to include things like feelings of enmity towards the government or India. So, you know, what are feelings of enmity? How do you uh, assess these feelings? I mean, all this is basically left to interpretation and therefore it's very easy for these laws to go well beyond what they ostensibly um, aim to do. The third layer of problems, which is less often discussed is that the laws are bad enough. On top of that, they can be misinterpreted and abused. But on top of that, there is a problem of state contempt for the law. The, very often the state actually go, ignores the laws and goes beyond them, them and uh, abuses civil liberties. This is a point that my, my friends in Kashmir uh, often made that, you know, he, they say our problem is not just AFSPA and all that. That's part of the problem. But it's also that the Indian government violates the law uh, that are there. For example, to my knowledge, there is no law in India <clears throat> that permits torture. And yet torture is routinely used in many parts of the country, including Kashmir in particular. 
uh, the use of torture in Kashmir is frightening, frighteningly routine. These, 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 this has been documented in great detail in many reports of the uh, Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Societies. These reports really make for chilling reading. They describe the methods in great detail. They include uh, vast numbers of testimonies that are consistent with each other and make it clear that they are not fabricated. And if you don't believe these human rights organizations, you can always listen to the police themselves. I mean, there are police officers like uh, Davinder Singh, for example, the person who tortured Afsal Guru and actually boasted about it in an interview with Parvez Bukhari. Uh, I think it's worth quoting a few lines of that interview because it's really frightening. Uh, this is what he said. He said, I did interrogate and torture of Salguru at my camp for several days. And we never recorded his arrest in the books anywhere. Afsal's description of torture at my camp is true. That was the procedure in those days. That was the procedure in those days. And we did pour petrol in his arse and gave him electric, electric shocks, but I could not break him. He did not reveal anything to me despite our hardest possible interrogation. And then a little further, he says, I had a reputation for torture, interrogation, and breaking suspects. If anybody came out of my interrogation clean, nobody would ever touch him again. He would be considered clean for good by the whole department. So not only is this person boasting of being good at torturing people for days, but on top of that, what he's saying is that I was so good at torturing that if I tortured somebody for days and that person did not confess anything, then we could be certain that he was innocent. In other words, he was boasting of, of having tortured innocent people for days, and yet no action is taken on this and it has not even caused the kind of uh, shock that it should have caused at that time. So this is the situation uh, in uh, Kashmir and not only in Kashmir. And finally, the fourth problem, uh, perhaps the hardest, is that, which reinforces the third one, is the problem of impunity, that the victims or anyone for that matter uh, finds it virtually impossible to hold the state accountable when it violates civil, civil liberties and breaks the law. There's no recourse in practice. Uh, many victims are not even allowed to uh, file complaints. And if they file complaints, they don't get anywhere or they are harassed. For instance, just to come back to the case of Kashmir again, uh, the last time I went there a few years ago, I learned that from a recent RTI, it had been learned that not a, there had so far not been a single instance of police or army per personnel being prosecuted, even in cases where they had been found uh, to be responsible for human rights violations, because that requires the permission of the state and the state so far had never given permission to prosecute. So I think these are the problems that we have to think about. Uh, I will not have a lot to say right now about how one can address these different problems, except to say that it seems to me that uh, one possibility is to try to persuade the opposition parties that they are in the line of fire and that they really need to commit themselves to legislation that deals with these uh, civil li liberties violations in the future. I don't think we can have much hope of change under the present regime, but maybe we can have some hope of persuading, persuading the political parties to see that sooner or later, they are also going to be victims of these kinds of abuses and that therefore they have a stake in committing themselves to change. There's some back background noise somewhere. Maybe somebody, somebody needs to mute. Uh, I'll conclude with a few words about the case of Stan Swamy because as I said, uh, it's a very important case. Uh, Stan Swamy was a friend of mine. Uh, a lot already has been written about him and what happened to him. So I don't have to repeat the facts. Uh, he was an extraordinary man, uh, remarkably gentle, honest, courageous. Uh, he was a man of principles who lived by his principles until the end. 
And when he said, uh, I am willing to pay the price, when he went to prison, I think uh, he meant that he knew that he might never come back, but he was ready for it. So I have a lot of admiration and affection for him. Um, where the whole country has been shocked, of course, by the way he has been treated, and in particular the manner in which bail was refused to him, despite the fact that he was not a flight risk, he was cooperating with the agencies, he was in very poor health, not only suffering from Parkinson's disease, but also other illnesses like arthritis and then later COVID and diarrhea and so, and so on and so forth. He was more or less being tortured when he was staying in jail. Uh, there were no facilities worth the name. There was no allopathic doctor in the jail where he was staying. There was absolutely no reason to retain him there. And yet, bail was refused. Now, that's a, that is really abominable cruelty and almost inexplicable, except that there is nothing to explain because that is how UAPA prisoners are almost always treated as a matter of routine. And that is what he himself kept saying, that it's not just me. Uh, uh, you know, all, all kinds of under trial prisoners are treated like that. So I think we have to think of uh, Stan himself and also of Stan as a symbol of the monumental injustice that is being done and that has been done for decades to under trial prisoners in India. Uh, we need not only to get rid of UAPA and the provisions in UAPA that make this kind of situation possible, but also uh, to bring about a better bail regime for all prisoners uh, that uh, gives them uh, their right to be considered um, non-guilty until proved uh, guilty. And finally, I think that Stan and what happened to Stan is a warning. And let me try to explain what I mean. I have read the charge sheet that was used to send, send Stan to prison quite carefully. Um, the charges are quite absurd. Uh, for example, I was shocked to discover this morning when I was looking at the specific sections of UAPA that he has been charged under, that one of them is section 16, which is committing a terrorist act. So he was accused of committing a terrorist act, but the act is not specified and let alone there being any evidence presented at all to substantiate this charge. Um, the charge sheet does not say anything about Stan that is not in the public domain. It certainly, I certainly didn't learn anything about Stan from the charge sheet that I didn't already know. It says that, uh, you know, he attended, he attended such and such meeting, he was in touch with so-and-so, he was active in such and such group, all that is well known. There's nothing new at all about this. So then how was he charged of, uh, you know, a conspiracy to overthrow the state and so on and so forth? Well, in the end, it seems to boil down to the fact that he was active in, two organizations uh, that are claimed in that charge sheet to be front organizations of the CPI Maoist, the Vistapan Virodi uh, Janandolan, uh, sorry, Vistapan Virodi Janvikar Sandolan and the Persecuted Prisoners Solidarity Committee. So the, uh, it's important here to remember that in the schedule of the UAPA, there's a list of so-called terrorist organizations and in the case and only in the case of the CPI Maoist, it says not only CPI Maoist, but CPI Maoist and all its formations and front organizations. And so the charge sheet claims without even defining a front organization or presenting any evidence that these organizations are front, uh, claims that these two organizations are front uh, organizations of the CPI Maoist. And since Stan was active in them, as we all know, uh, it, it is claimed to follow that he was a member of the CPI Maoist and active in the Maoist party itself and committing acts of terrorism, which is all utterly absurd. Now, why this is a warning is because in the same spreadsheet, uh, not spreadsheet, chart sheet, I'm sorry, in the same chart sheet, many other organizations are claimed to be front organizations of the CPI Maoist, including, would you believe, PODR and PUCL. PUCL is a, actually a relatively conservative organization with thousands of members across the country uh, holding all kinds of different views. And uh, if you go by this chart sheet, all these people are now 
um, exposed because of their association with PUCL, which is claimed to be a front of the CPI Maoist, to being treated uh, in this sort of manner. So what I'm saying is that the news is in place and any time all kinds of people, including many of us, can be claimed through this change of, through this very strange uh, chain of reasoning to be uh, part of a conspiracy against the state. So uh, I will end here and try to contribute later some ideas of how things can move forward. But I think it's important, important to be aware of the gravity of the situation and of the possibility of uh, many more arrests thing, taking place in the near future, um, given what has already happened. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your thoughts. I will now ask um, Kalpana Kanabiran uh, uh, to, to speak and uh, just a, again, a short introduction for Kalpana. Um, Kalpana Kanabiran is a feminist sociologist, <laughs> lawyer and human rights columnist. Based in Hyderabad, India, she co-founded Asmita Resource Center for Women in 1991 and was on the founding faculty of Nalsar University of Law 1999 to 2009 and was Professor and Director, Council for Social Development, Hyderabad from 2011 to 2021. She's also Civil Society Advisory Governor, Asia Region for the Commonwealth Foundation, London. She's the author of Tools of Justice, Non-Discrimination and the Indian Constitution. This came out in 2012. And among her recent books are Migration Workers and Fundamental Freedoms, Pandemic Vulnerabilities and States of Exception in India, 2021. Gender Regimes and the Politics of Privacy, a Feminist Rereading of Putthuswami versus Union of India, 2021, and Law, Justice and Human Rights, Short Reflections. This is forthcoming also in October 2021. So a very warm welcome to you, Kalpana. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Rosinka. And uh, thank you to CSSS for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, I uh, had I had never met uh, Anjum, but uh, know him well through his work. And uh, as uh, as uh, Jean mentioned, uh, Arthur's uh, tribute to Anjum in EPW, which I've also read. Uh, I recalled as Jean was speaking that uh, the, you know the com the combination of uh, the rough and tumble of political life and intellectual uh, life uh, is something that certainly sets Anjan apart, and you can see that in the uh, film clip uh, that Paranjoy showed us. Uh, but also it calls to mind uh, another dear friend who we lost yesterday, and I would also like to remember her, Gail Ombet, uh, who like uh, Anjan combined the rough and tumble of political life with, uh, with an amazing uh, array of uh, scholarship. Uh, so they, they, uh, I, I think what, uh, what, what really makes uh, life livable in the academia uh, is the work of people who combine these two. Uh, or uh, should I make it more personal and say, what makes my life uh, more livable within the academia, or what made my life more livable in the academia is the ways in which uh, people like Anjan and Gail uh, combined the rough and tumble of political life with, uh, with intellectual uh, activity. I was uh, actually uh, thinking quite a bit about the title for a very long time, the title of the seminar, uh, Can the Law Defend Civil Liberties? Uh, I was um, uh, a bit puzzled and I, uh, you know, uh, understood immediately what Joe was saying. How do, what, what do you actually uh, focus on and how do you approach uh, this uh, topic? Uh, the law is, of course, uh, within the frame of the sentence, the law is, of course, generic. It could be anything from the UAPA to the Constitution. And civil liberties are particular and specific and can be defended in very specific ways. 
using a specific mode of interpretation of the law, which is then another space of the law. And uh, so the, uh, you know, the way I might approach it is not so much to ask the question, can the law defend civil liberties? But what methods might we deploy to make the law defend civil liberties? Because when we are talking about about uh, the defense of civil liberties, we're talking quite centrally of the Constitution. And we are talking about Article 21 rights and all the other rights that circulate around and intervene with Article 21. So it is a very specific part of, um, of, of constitutional law that we are holding up to counterbalance uh, the, the derogation of fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms or civil liberties, if you like, which may be in the, which may be the derogation may be based on a violation of law. The derogation may be also based on the uh, stringent implementation of draconian legislation, illegal legislation, which flouts the norms of the constitution. So there's also that there is the question of unjust law and uh, you know how how do we then approach the question of law in order to frame the defense of civil liberties and i think that that is really the biggest challenge that confronts us today uh, as uh, scholars and activists uh, and organizers and people in the opposition i wouldn't see this as completely watertight and separate. How do, how do the people of this country begin to make the law work in defense of civil liberties? Because what we are seeing much more is the breach of, um, of, of civil liberties. I, I would also like to uh, begin with uh, Kashmir. And I'm really glad uh, Jean actually made an extended reference to Kashmir. Uh, the abrogation of Article 370 is law. The uh, unregulated Ill, uh, use of the Public Safety Act uh, triggering arbitrary arrest is law. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, shutting down of communication and internet um, in Kashmir uh, is also administrative law. So it's not the law is not just law enacted in parliament. There's also administrative law, law in governance, and there's also a law uh, th that uh, takes effect through interpretation within courts. So the shutdown of internet in the valley, the shutdown of communications, the shutdown of supplies, um, and the barricading of the state, the reduction of the state, uh, and the barricading of the state, and the disappearance of the state and its reduction to two union territories are all law. What does it do to the people? Uh, how do we even begin? We know the specific violations that have happened over the span of three decades or more, but how do we begin to understand the defense of civil liberties if we put Kashmir at the center of the Indian understanding of civil liberties? How would that understanding shift? Would that understanding shift at all? If it would, what are the lessons Kashmir has? What are the lessons that Kashmiri people have to teach us about making the law work to defend civil liberties? This is really a huge question before us. And I do think that in speaking about the defense of civil liberties and in talking about the relationship between law and civil liberties, Kashmir must be the starting point and at the center of our reflections on where and how we have gone wrong and where and how where the solutions might lie and what the methods might be. We, of course, have the case of Father Stan Swami. We have the case uh, along with Father Stan Swami and, and Father Stan Swami's death uh, is uh, you know, uh, capital punishment by other means. And let's make no mistake about it. 
It is nothing less than the death penalty. If you know a person is ill, you know that there is nothing uh, in, in your own records that implicate the person uh, in order to have him incarcerated under this particular law and incarcerated in, in that fashion, uh, you know that the person is likely to die in prison. Uh, when you don't know it, you are informed that the person is too ill and might actually die in prison. And you still don't, uh, you, you still are not empowered enough. Uh, and when I say you, I mean the courts are still not empowered enough to set that person at liberty. What that default setting does is that it confirms the imposition of the death penalty by other means. And unless we begin to take note of the ways and, and the extent and the gravity of uh, jurisprudential dissociation, uh, I don't think we can even begin to understand how the law may defend civil liberties. Because let's also remember that when Stan Swami, when Father Stan Swami died, the uh, uh, judge in the Bombay High Court, in fact, uh, uh, said, said a few words, not a whole lot, uh, praising Father Stan Swami's dedication and his commitment and his work. And the NIA took objection since he was a prisoner under UAPA, the NIA took objection. The NIA could well take objection, but what did the court then do? The judge withdrew his comment. So there is a term that Justice Leela Seth used in the context of uh, Section 377 when it was still in place. She used the word judicial pusillanimity. And I really think that what we are seeing large scale with very, very few exceptions, the exceptions mostly in dissenting opinions is the playing out of judicial pusillanimity. And I think that we really need to, you know, uh, and, and the, the question also uh, that looms before me is uh, how are we going to push our way through this? It can't be just the question of waiting till individual judges retire, or it can't be a question of waiting till the opposition comes to power, because we don't know what part of that motley opposition will come to power. We don't know that the opposition that comes to power will actually defend civil liberties. So unless as citizens, we, we have a program shift that encompasses the diversity and the plurality of responses and experiences to this large, large scale derogation, there is no way that we can hold either this government or the governments after it to account. And really the question is, how do we hold this government to account? And uh, the, 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 the related question is, how do we hold courts to account? The fact, of course, remains that the UAPA has very stringent provisions. But those stringent provisions are not identical where it concerns terrorist activities that may be anything and terrorist organizations which are listed in the schedule. If you look at the judgment uh, in the Safura Zargar case, the uh, trial court judgment in the Safura Zargar case, you will see that the, uh, there is a conflation between uh, terrorist activity and terrorist organization. And the, uh, the terrorist activity that she is actually accused of is participating in a roadblock, in a chakka jam, you know? And uh, the, the refusal to give bail is not something that is inherent in a law. The refusal to give bail is part of a considered rational decision by the judge 
in interpreting the law. And that is yet another part of the law. So you have the enactment. The enactment may be just or unjust, but you have the interpretation of the enactment. Even an unjust enactment has savings and the interpretation can set an unjust incarceration right. Because there is no law that is above the constitution and the constitution affirms and insists on the right to human dignity, on the right to life with dignity, on the right to fair trial, on the right to personal liberty, except according to procedure established by law, that procedure established by law must be due process and must be fair and transparent and must be seen to be so. So there is a lot that actually relies on the wisdom and the commitment and the courage of individual judges. So when a bail application comes before a judge, what is the way in which the judge ought to approach that bail application? There is something in the law called the proportionality standard. The proportionality standard is quite simple. It's just how do you balance the means and the ends? How do you make sure that the means, and you want to eliminate terrorist activity, but how do you ensure that the specific A, B, C, D means in relation to A, B, C, D individual actually matches the ends or is likely to lead to the uncovering of your terrorist organizations. So this, the, the, the standard is something that is not applied at all in trial courts. And also we see is not applied in the appellate courts, in the high court and in the Supreme Court. We had just uh, the lawyer um, from Kashmir, Mr. Kayum, who was in prison. He was in jail, he was ill. He was not released till the one year uh, of detention under the Public Safety Act was actually exhausted and he was released one day before Eid. So it wasn't any judicial magnanimity or it wasn't any humanitarian concern. It was just that the law had exhausted itself and there was no option except to release it. And in, in this kind of context, <clears throat> in, different, in different, different situations, and I can actually multiply situations for you. We can look at the encounter case uh, in Hyderabad, for instance. You can look at the uh, Supreme Court order of February 2019 evicting uh, forest dwellers uh, from the forest and naming them as encroachers, despite having the, for, you know, the Forest Rights Act. Um, you can look at the Prevention of Atrocities Act and the Supreme Court actually saying that, uh, you know, uh, false complaints are made against good people, these good people being upper caste people. So the, the law is importantly both the enactment and its interpretation. So you have a bad law, which might have a saving, which can be interpreted to uphold dignity under the constitution, which is not being done. So Father Stan Swami died, but you have all the others who've been imprisoned under UAPA continuing to be in prison and continuing to be refused bail. And there is really no reason why they should be kept in prison. You have friends of ours in PUDR, in PUCL, in the um, Sai Baba Defense Committee, who have had visits from NIA off the record and interrogations by the NIA off the record in their homes. And there is a soft targeting of intellectual civil libertarians that is underway even as this. The death penalties, there is also the death penalty by other means. There, is, there are disappearances of entire states, forget about people. We are earlier talking about disappearances of people. We're talking about disappearances of entire states now. And then you have the morphing of good law into bad law under the watch of the constitution and the Supreme Court of India. So the task before us as scholars, as activists, 
as uh, as uh, people invested in a radical democratic deliberative politics the challenge is really before us in what methods and what conversations are we going to set in motion in order to make the law defend civil liberties most effectively thank you thank you so much uh, thank you for your thoughts i will now ask uh, Alok Rai to uh, switch on his camera while I uh, introduce him briefly again. Um, Professor Alok Rai retired from the Department of English, University of Delhi, uh, born and bred in Allahabad. Um, Professor Rai's first book was on George Orwell and it was published as Orwell and the Politics of Despair. He has also written influentially on the formation of modern Hindi in his book, Hindi Nationalism, which was published in 2001 in Macmillan's Tracts for the Time series. His translation of Premchand's Nirmala was also published in the same year by Oxford University Press. He has been involved in the business of writing with language and society, with modern literature, and with cultural processes in modern North India, with particular references to issues of language and literature all his life. He has written extensively on these matters. Um, so a very warm welcome to you today, Alok. Um, yes, there you are. Uh, Please uh, take over. Okay. Thank you, <clears throat> you Razenka. Um, let me see. Let me get my distance right. I'm probably too close to the camera. Um, I feel, uh, to be honest, I feel quite unworthy in this company with uh, Kalpana Kannabiran and Jyotra both with their experience both in the field of law and in the field of social action. And... Uh, I feel like a kind of somewhat useless academic in this context, but I won't labor that point, won't tell you the many ways in which I feel unworthy, but I'll try and do something to justify my presence here. So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, let me see what I can make of the puzzle which the title of the, of the panel discussion poses. Because of course, in some sense, uh, uh, the ideal relationship between law and rights is ancillary, complementary. Rights come from the law. The institutions of the law exist in order to protect those rights. However, in a country where hundreds of people can be held in detention for over a year, and the Supreme Court cannot even find, manage to hear their habeas corpus petitions, Clearly, we are in a less than ideal condition. Right. Ideally, there should be nothing to discuss. But the fact that such a panel could even be conceived of, that we can actually come together and say, hang on, there appears to be a kind of contradiction between the way in which the, the law functions and the exercise of civil rights in this country, already indicates that we are in a domain of pathology and uh, I would argue in a zone of malignancy. And I, you know, at least part of the time, I want to elaborate on what I, on the way in which I understand this malignancy. Um, since uh, Jean Dres and Kalpana Kannabiran have already spoken and, you know, named many of the instances, and there are really far too many for anybody to name in any panel discussion, no matter how long. I, I really don't see that there is any need to talk about the under trial prisoners, talk about people, people being tortured, talk about this. There's certainly no need for melodrama for, for, for uh, Father Stan Swami shaking, shaking hands and the denial of a stroke. All that is unnecessary. The, the bare facts are bad enough. It doesn't need, it doesn't need any further emotional dressing to condemn the present dispensation as one that is fundamentally inimical to the exercise of civil rights. Uh, when these institutions, and I don't, and I mean the whole range of them, the police, significant pockets of the magistracy and the judiciary, as well as the ancillary sectors of civil society, 
the doctors, the ones who, who, who give the false medical certificates, the journalists who report lies, when these themselves turn malignant, this is a condition which has gone beyond individual culpability and individual corruption. There is something systemic that is, that is there. And my own metaphor, I suppose, for understanding it is that this, the system is suffering from a kind of autoimmune disease. The institutions that were supposed to protect the body had themselves turned upon the body's own organs and begun to attack them. I, I wonder, I am prone to this kind of thing, so I, I will propose it. Is the image of an AIDS afflicted system anything more than a fancy metaphor? Does, does the idea of a system that is afflicted with AIDS in which the immune system, the protective systems of the body have themselves turned on the body, on the organs of the body. Does this metaphor have any analytic force? And uh, by way of uh, illustration of this, I want to take a relatively anodyne example. So uh, no UAPA, not Dima Kuregaon, not Kashmir, all right. There was a recent incident at the Sagar University and uh, uh, Apurvanand and uh, on a Gohar, I think, Gohar Raza wrote about it, that they were, they were invited to speak at a seminar in Sagar University. And the local ABVP unit approached the police and told the police that they anticipated public mischief, which they were, would be upset by. And so the police, in turn, approached the university and said, hang on, we've been warned that there might be public mischief. And then if there is mischief, there will be public outrage. And then if there's public outrage, there'll be damage to facilities and so on. And you will be held responsible, whereupon, the university, of course, simply withdrew permission. No bones broken, no harsh words used. There was a strictly legal route whereby an illegal outcome was obtained. This, this is something that is, is offers, to my mind, a kind of perfect illustration of what uh, ha Thomas Hansen, in a recent book called The Law of Force. This is the well-oiled system in which key elements of the state are complicit, whether through, and uh, not, not whether, but both, through acts of omission and acts of commission in order to endow the exercise of force, of violence or the threat of violence, which is also a form of violence, to endow these with the force of law, with the protection of law. So people, people who are patently criminal in our society, society and I'm always amused to hear this, they piously intone their desire for the law to take its course. Let the law take its course. This is because they know that the law at key points, at key moments, can be suborned to do their bidding. There is a perfectly legal way. There are perfectly legal ways to achieve illegal, unjust ends, both by doing by being hyper efficient about arresting and by not doing, as in turning up late or not at all and being slipshod in gathering evidence, in total control of the process so as to ensure then that when the law takes its own course, it always ends up in the desired place. So that Stan Swami can be denied bail and die of medical neglect in state custody, what Kalpana Kannabiran, I think, very aptly described as death sentence, capital punishment by other means. The lout who in full public view 
fired a gun at the CAA demonstrators can swan around. He has no problem getting bail. Right? And this was this was on, on public public TV, national TV, everybody saw it. The police were there observing everything, indeed offering him protection. All of this is perfectly legal, and the protective immune system is happily chomping away at the organs. So by optimally hybridizing efficiency and neglect, both are key to the process. So by hybridizing efficiency and neglect, it allows the body's vital organs to waste away. Now, the question really is, is there anything that can be done about it? And I think uh, particularly uh, Kalpana Kannavaran spoke eloquently about, you know, the, the means of redress that might be available. And uh, certainly the amount of play there is in the operation of the law for something to be possible there. My own, my own take on this is rather narrower, but let me explain what I mean. People who think about this, generally it is retired police officers, uh, are forced to talk about police reform. And then they, they, various, various means are suggested, like educating them to become human beings or nearly human beings, or indeed more technically of uh, splitting the investigative and the prosecutor, prosecutorial arms of the police so that they, they, that one can, as it were, hold it, be a check on the other. But I personally don't have very much hope there, quite simply because the reform that is required is the reform of the colonial police. And the colonial police has a deep commitment to a dispensation which is colonial, essentially colonial in nature, i.e. it's not a rights-based dispensation, but a dispensation that is calculated to de deliver repression. However, these, oh, I was, <laughs> I, I had in, I, I, doing my, do my research for this, I, I uh, came upon an oft-cited remark of Justice Mullah of the Allahabad High Court in 1961, where he said that there is not a single lawless group in the whole of the country whose record of crime comes anywhere near the record of that organized unit, which is known as the Indian Police Force, unquote. However, my concern really here is not with, the, with police reform, even though it would be a consummation devoutly to be wished. However, my concern as a citizen is with the remedies, if any, that might be available if all those good suggestions, which generally retired and very rarely serving police officers offer for police reform. And in thinking about this, I have been drawn increasingly to the idea of sovereign immunity. Now, um, obviously, it is, it is the notion of sovereign immunity that enables the impunity, the murderous impunity that we are dealing with when we are talking about these cases of the denial of civil liberties and indeed capital punishment by other means. Now, it seems to me perfectly obvious, except that it is not discussed often enough in our public, public discourse, but the idea of sovereign immunity is a very strange one for it to be around in a Republican context. I can understand sovereign immunity being invoked in an international context, even though I recognize that there is an obvious contradiction between sovereign immunity and international law. So that one has the somewhat slightly silly spectacle of the government of India pleading sovereign immunity in a New Jersey court 
against the claims of Cairn International. Now, it, it seems like a, like a somewhat pitiable sovereign who pleads sovereign immunity. However, I don't want to go into that, into the tension between sovereign immu immunity and international law. I am particularly concerned with the way in which the notion of sovereign Im immunity is sought to be uh, inserted into law within the country. Now, the, the, as it happens, the, the Indian state has a rather Catholic understanding of sovereign immunity. So, it, you know, I mean, my own, uh, again, my own <laughs> researches in this turned up a, a case from the early 60s when a, an Amritsar jeweler was arrested in Meerut on a charge of theft and the gold jewelry that he had in his possession was taken from him. He was subsequently released, but the jewelry was not returned to him. The jewelry, in turn, was stolen by the head constable of the police station where he had been arrested. And the head constable fled to Pakistan. However, when this poor man, Kasturi Lal Jain, sought to get his jewelry back, the, the state council pleaded sovereign immunity. Because, of course, the head constable had been acting probably within, stealing within the police station. Now, it seems to me that, that the idea of sovereign immunity really has, has no legs to stand on in a Republican context. And, and the courts have recognized this again and again. This is, it is reassuring to know that uh, in various cases in the Andhra versus, state of Andhra versus Venugopal, AIR 1964, SC 33, and the state of Andhra versus Challa Ramakrishna Reddy, AIR 2000, SC 2083, are unambiguous that the idea of sovereign immunity has no place in a republic and that the actions of the state and the actions of the agents of the state are liable for the liable under the law of torts. This is, this is again, the Supreme Court in the in 2000 judgment. I quote, the maxim that the king can do no wrong or that the crown is not answerable in tort has no place in Indian jurisprudence where the power rests not in the crown, but in the people who elect their representatives to run the government, which has to act in provisions with the provisions of the constitution and would be answerable to the people for any violation thereof. So as far as the law is concerned, it is perfectly clear that there is no, there's no, there is no defense available to, uh, for, for, uh, to, to, the, to the state and to its agents on the grounds of immunity. However, it might be necessary to keep reminding the institutions of the state, particularly the judici judiciary, that there is no defense of immunity that is available to anybody. They are all open to being charged, that they are all liable for their actions. Now, I, I mean, to my lay understanding, I am no lawyer, but to my lay understanding, that seems perfectly clear and seems like a way of acting. Of course, the, the Indian state has always tried to, has both repeatedly sought to overlook the fact that the judiciary has, has struck down the idea of sovereign immunity, but the Indian state has also tried to weasel out of what follows from the end of sovereign immunity, and therefore what follows from being liable under torts, which is to say compensation. That the people who have been denied their rights for years confined and incarcerated for years and years. People die there. And, and once again, I don't want to go, don't want to get melodramatic, melodramatic about it at all. But again, the Supreme Court 
In the case of, uh, again, DK Basu versus the state of West Bengal, AIR 2004 SC7, again, reaffirmed that the state is liable and the state recognizes, for instance, most recently in the case of uh, Nambi Narayan in uh, the, the ISRO spy case in uh, Kerala. So the state is liable to pay compensation in the case of a violation of rights. All right. But there is one, still one final question that I wish to raise. That, so, so there is both, there's the end of sovereign immunity, there's a consequent liability, there's the need to extend the ambit of this liability from the immediate agents to the people on whose behalf those agents are acting. So that all the people in the chain of actions that result in illegal outcomes must be held liable. Now this, this it seems to me that the law is perfectly clear that the state owes compensation. The final question I wish to raise is, from whom is this compensation due? Not to whom, from whom is this compensation due? Because in one of these, I think it's in the, in the DK Basu judgment, the Supreme Court said that the state is called upon to, to ascertain whether the agents who, who committed those actions of which compensation is due were acting legally or not. And if they were acting illegally, then <coughs> the compensation that is given should be taken from the agents who were acting illegally. Fine. However, if the state is acting illegally, i.e. if the state is compelled to compensate, the implication is that the action of the state is illegal, then as a citizen, I have the right to demand and to remind the judiciary that I have a right to demand that the state not act illegally. That, that so to speak, the diversion of tax revenues for compensating for illegal action, whether it is in small matters or large matters like Kashmir, is still a violation of the existing and recognized laws of our own courts. The law is explicit on this matter. And basically, it seems to me one way is to keep pressing the legal system itself to do what it is required to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Alok. Um, we will now throw this open uh, to the audience. You are, it would be better perhaps to type your questions into the chat box, but if you would rather just raise your hand, you could do that. Um, or uh, just, uh, of course, if everybody unmutes themselves all at the same time, it will be a bit of a problem, but we could, uh, we could go that way as well. If you can uh, show yourself and indicate that you wish to speak, we can, we can take questions from there. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm glad that our title, Can the Law Defend uh, Civil Liberties, uh, sort of raised so many different questions in, in uh, all three of you. Um, and and you, uh, each of you spent some time uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, interpreting uh, what we might have meant uh, by that title. One unifying um, thing that seems to have come up is without a doubt uh, that the law in India is under greater strain than ever before. Um, Kashmir has been placed at the center of civil liberties in India by uh, all of you. You each have spoken individually, uh, not just about the judiciary, but about police reform, about courts. Uh, you have uh, uh, very usefully, I think, in each in your own way, tried to answer the questions uh, uh, that Kalpana summarized as, how are we going to push our way through this? How do we hold governments and courts and if I can add the police to account 
these these seem to be the central questions in in each of your deliberations today and i was i was i was interested also by um the fact that none of you actually uh, uh um sort of focused on the fact that we had said can the law defend civil li civil liberties in india of course as we are located in india and we are we are worried very worried about the situation in the country uh, as it stands today but as you were speaking i was thinking in fact uh, of the recent george floyd case and of the manner in which the us uh, uh, us laws have historically failed to defend the civil li civil liberties of black men of course in that country um, uh, so so but our discussion today is specific to india and you have you have summarized uh, uh, each of you uh have, you have given us your own thoughts on the matter thank you for that i will now invite questions i know that manush rai uh, wishes to ask a question he uh, uh messaged me uh, 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 uh about that so manush rai if you can if you want to start uh, the discussion with your question then we will take um for the questions as they come up are you there hello can you can you hear yes. me yes yes please go ahead yeah uh thanks to all the panelists and i must admit this has been the richest uh, webinar that i have attended in our pandemic times so thank you very much to all the three panelists now i will ask a question about which i have been personally wrestling for quite some time and it's very simple the question is does absolute majority in the parliament in a way effectively makes the law court defunct because all that the law court can do in the liberal system is to recommend certain you know steps is to sort of find certain problems with the bill that was passed in the parliament and refer it back to the parliament what if the parliament decides to stick to the bill that you know it has passed and relatedly you know regarding the discussion on kashmir which i think was very valid you see all the uh, tortures brutalities illegalities that you talk about were there even before the abrogation of 370 which is not to say i mean i'm not commenting on 370 i think the abrogation was um, i mean it cannot be tolerated but then think within the frame uh, in which even when kashmir uh, was treated as a special case a candidate for special protection the abrogations could continue and related again and this is my last question i think you know uh, what i read in professor rai's wonderful discussion um uh, i read in him uh, you know a, the case that agamben was making for whom the liberal constitution you know is constituted around an illiberal moment when the constitution constitutionally can withdraw itself from functioning now this is one way of uh, challenging the liberal system but you know as you know that michel foucault had a different understanding of how the liberal uh, states operate you see it in three different axes one is the security axis anything that the state thinks makes its existence you know puts its existence in peril can be challenged second the ethical axis that is to make the subject citizens you know in here the kind of basic ideology of the state and finally the economic access which is to see the entire economic activities uh, in terms of utility so 
one way of interpreting would be that whenever the state senses uh, some peril to itself, it heightens the security axis, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the other two axes. So how are we going to interpret uh, India, particularly in the last few years, when we are seeing, you know, a uh, uh, I mean, laws not been obeyed um, and what else. So thank you very much. Um, I ask these three questions to all the three panelists and thank you once again for that wonderful deliberation, which I'll remember for many, many days to come. Thank you, Manushta. Um, so who would like to take the questions first of the three speakers or would you like to collect questions if there are i don't see any other raised hands though and manushta has raised quite a few questions so asinka i can just respond uh, yes please to uh, two parts of what uh, Manushda raised one uh, on absolute uh, majority, uh, and and the second on uh, Kashmir on on the on on the abrogation of Article Three Seventy. Uh, on absolute majority, um, of course, I mean, if there is a, a party with an absolute majority in power, and they do come up uh, with enactments uh, like this. I'm sorry, the connection seems to be. Yeah, sorry, Kalpana. Could Which you get the lost its area? I mean, I think the sound is muted. Can't hear me? I think we yeah, sorry, the connection seems to, yeah, it was just um, going dark. Uh, I mean, not visually, but um, orally. Manushta, did you hear the last couple of sentences? She got lost entirely. Yeah, it was lost, wasn't it? I didn't hear it as well. I was wondering whether it's my connection or... Uh, I think uh, Kalpana's I think, connection. I think it's frozen now. now as well. yeah. Kalpana, are you there? No, it seems to have frozen. So we'll wait for her to reconnect or realize yeah. that it's frozen, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in the meantime, uh, if Alok or Jean would like to respond, or, or should we no, go yeah. collect her? Yeah, Alok. All right. Okay. No, I. I. Uh, look, uh, Manish, to thank you. Uh, but I mean, you know the. Uh, As far as the, uh, the the question of the absolute majority is concerned, obviously, you know, I mean, I I do like to think, at any rate, that the constitution puts some kind of limit on on the exercise of that absolute majority. But I think there's a there's a larger point which interests me, and which is my my kind of uh, uh, feeble take on these legal matters, which is that which is the which is the point that you raise about the tension between Agamben and, and Foucault, you know that. Or, or the the three axes of this, uh, the, the 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 security, the economic, and so on. That that on the one hand, basically that that no use of language, no matter how carefully drafted the legal document is, can ever be free of play, and that that it is precisely through that play of language that that one seeks to shift understandings in one direction or another you know now so so whereas whereas tidy minded people despair of precisely this malleability of language i derive a certain hope from this that you know where where someone someone can as it were trump my trump my humanity with security i can also try and you know and move some other linguistic levers in order to 
modify their discourse. Because I don't know that there is a way out of this puzzle, frankly, you know, about the, 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 the state which reserves the space to become illiberal in a state of exception. You know, that how we can get out of it short of keeping on pressing on certain principles which the state itself in some moments deems essential. You know, so back to the constitution. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Kalpana's uh, uh, connection seems to have come back now. Kalpana, would you like to continue? I'm sorry, but we couldn't hear the last couple of sentences. We heard you towards the beginning, but it was just the last bit. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm at, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, because uh, I, I seem to be just going on and off uh, because I actually didn't go off. I could see and hear you right through. Uh, but I'm just going to try and do this quickly. Um, on absolute majority, just to continue where I uh, left off, I think that the key really is to... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, the, the, the key really seems to be uh, in, uh, in constitutional interpretation, you know, that you can actually have an unjust law that goes through, but the uh, test really comes when that unjust law is implemented. And at the stage of in implementation is when the injustice becomes a material fact. And it is that material fact when taken to court, you can actually get uh, an overriding interpretation of the constitution that interrogates that particular implementation of the law. That is in fact the, the interpretive, you know, the interpretive standards that the constitution gives is what we are banking on in every case that goes to court under the UAPA or under any of the security legislations. But the problem, of course, comes when courts become majoritarian and refuse to apply the interpretive standard. So you have a very odd situation now where several uh, judges outside, either immediately after their term or during their term, but not within the courtroom when they are giving a speech outside speak about the defense of civil liberties and the next day when there is a case in front of them they don't actually defend civil liberties in the case that is before them so there is this uh, you know this kind of split in the way in which the judiciary seems to act on the bench and off the bench but if, the, if we ensure that there isn't that split, if we actually bring pressure on courts to interpret laws using the touchstone of the constitution, which is the way they term it, I think that to a large extent, the tyranny of the absolute majority can be offset because we can't forget that the constitution in fact is a guarantee for the citizen against a tyrannical state. Your entire part three gives you fundamental freedoms against a tyrannical state. So the, the problem really is uh, boils down then to working the constitution differently. Even with the UAPA, we are talking about Father Stan Swami and all the others who have been uh, uh, imprisoned under the UAPA, but the UAPA was not the invention of the current regime. It was brought in by the earlier regime, but it is being uh, used in very particular ways. Earlier regimes, it was mainly against political dissenters. In the present regime, it is being expanded and used in very, very different ways. So we fought it in the earlier regime. We must fight it now. And there have to be, re you, there have to be methods that we devise uh, to fight. Similarly, also with Kashmir. It's uh, like I did say when I spoke about Kashmir that this is not something that began in 2019. It has a much, much older history. But how do we use 
what are the lessons we learn from that history in the long durée and in in that entire history leading or culminating in the disappearance of the state so what does that final moment actually signal to us in terms of what mobilization strategies should be in order to entrench fundamental freedoms better so thank you for that um dishari shorkar has had her hand raised for quite some time now dishari would you like to ask your question yourself uh, you can put your hand down now if you if you want and would you like to ask it yourself or should we read it off the chat box um ma'am can you hear me yes we can hear you oh okay ma'am uh ma'am uh, i don't know if it is uh, if it is off the topic ma'am but since i cannot resist myself to use this opportunity ma'am my question is to kalpana ma'am um ma'am uh, we are talking about law and civil liberties so ma'am uh, how do we look at the uh, problem that we are facing specifically from uh, women uh, rajwangshi women and women uh, adivasi women specifically in this that uh, uh, area of west bengal that uh, the quasi judicial bodies like khap panchayat and their effect on women bodies like in the month of uh, june there are six cases that were published in newspaper now we know about the six cases but there are uh, many cases that went uh, like unregistered so ma'am uh, how to look at this problem legally and how to liberate women from this uh, ordeal ma'am uh, can you please uh, like to shed light on this topic ma'am um so sure, thank you uh, for that question i wouldn't call uh, khap panchayat quasi judicial bodies uh, uh, they are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, community based uh, uh, you know uh, you know community based forms of regulating uh, behavior uh, and you find them not only among uh, adivasis possibly uh, you know the cases that you uh, mention are quite specific but you find them all over where they could be called khap panchayats they need not be called khap panchayats but the fact that caste um, uh, you know and and, and community uh, particularly dominant elements uh, by right. or inevitably mm -hmm. it is men of castes and communities Uh, regulate uh, mm -hmm. and control female bodies particularly in relation to uh, to marriage uh, but also in relation to um, to reproductive rights and uh, ownership of property and a whole range of mm -hmm. um, of rights to basic freedoms for women Uh, there is uh, really nothing uh, you know in, in in the sense that you can't um really do uh, very much in terms of reforming these community based uh, bodies if they are in fact uh, you know uh, mirror images of khap panchayats uh, and all male uh, in 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 their uh, constitution mm -hmm. uh, except to you know it, it, it except to set in motion a uh, a whole process of public education where women of these communities begin to assert their autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the men of the communities and it can be any community this isn't related this isn't restricted to any one tribe or caste or community you find it across the board and i will give you a simple example uh, you had uh, in uh, tamil nadu you had a a group of uh, uh, muslim women you know i mean the the jamaat used to meet in the mosque and women were not permitted into the mosque and all cases of marital dispute uh, would be settled in the mosque 
And most often these involved murders of wives, um, dowry, desertion of wives, uh, bigamy, uh, refusal to maintain, all of which curtailed women's fundamental freedoms in really? very, very basic and serious ways. And one of the things that, uh, you know, women who were organizing the Muslim women in that area, uh, Sharifa Khanum is the one person who uh, is very well known for this. One of the things that she did was that she just gathered all the Muslim women and uh, particularly the women who came with cases, but also the elder Muslim women in the community and uh, told them that they were setting up a women's mosque. And uh, whatever cases the Jamaat decided was, it was uh, decided by the male Jamaat because mm -hmm. there were no men there. And women would respond, not individually, but through the women's Jamaat. And of course, there was consternation, there was anger. But over a period of time, the Jamaat in the, in the main mosque, the male Jamaat, began to consult the women's Jamaat on specific cases so that they could reach an amicable solution. So that there, is really no, uh, there, there is really no alternative to a public and political education on rights. Oh. And this has been found to work in very many different places. So that is the only thing that I can say on this question at this point. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Kalpana. Thank you so much. Um, Topatidi, you had a question. I unmute and ask. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, we can't see you though, but we can hear you. Yeah, there you are. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, again, I'd like to really thank all three speakers for uh, really a very, very uh, riveting and uh, interrogative session. Uh, I had a question or rather a comment, but I will pose it as a question, uh, which is when we ask about how we defend civil liberties or how we make the law defend civil liberty, I think one of the very pressing questions is that of evidence. Uh, and we know that uh, the protection of evidence, like the protection of the witness, were often very, very major issues. Now we are looking at a series of cases where on the one hand, we see the flagrant manufacture manipulation and planting of evidence. And that is being done by using high level technologies that can plant information and evidence long distance into computers. With Pegasus spyware, we know it's now taken on a whole new dimension. So that is at the level of literally manufacturing and manipulating evidence over which then the accused has absolutely no hand in either controlling or protecting. And on the other hand, we are looking at a situation of the destruction of evidence in its most blatant forms from the silencing of journalists who wish to report. And the Hathras incident is only one of many where Siddiq Kapan remains incarcerated uh, to many. Uh, Sanjeev Bhatt, who remains because he's witness. Uh, but I'm also thinking of the most brutal cases in recent times, which involved the burning of bodies of two young Dalit girls in Hathras and in the Delhi crematorium rape case, where one wishes to do away with even the evidence of the dead body. So we are dealing here with certain extreme positions of even destroying the very idea of what evidence was meant to me. And, you know, across disciplines from a discipline like ours, which is history, which respected evidence, even as one accepted different interpretations. I think when we're dealing with state, court, police, and law, I think that this ultimate, uh, you could say, dissolution of the very meaning and integrity of the term evidence is at stake. And I wanted therefore to have a response to that. 
So, Jai, you have not spoken yet. Would you like to? I think this is a question for Kalpana. But I can, if you want me to speak, I can just add something on what was said earlier. All three of you, uh, whoever wants to go. Which, which pertains uh, partly to the questions that have been posed and partly to some points that Kalpana and uh, Alok have made. Uh, both of them, uh, quite rightly, I think, drew attention to the importance of holding the courts ac accountable because it's really the courts that should be holding the state accountable for its failure to protect civil liberties. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work in a democracy. Um, but the problem today is that we somehow we can't count on the courts anymore. And uh, by the way, I think there was perhaps a minor factual issue in what the way Kalpana described the rejection of uh, Stan's bail application because it's actually the court that deliberately refused. I don't think that they had no choice. They had a choice, or maybe they felt that they had no choice because there's an understanding that you have to refuse the bail, that's possible. But they did give an argument in the uh, rejection of bail application. They said that, you know, on the one hand, we have this person who is ill and uh, has a certain right to liberty. And on the other hand, we have the public interest because, you know, uh, it might uh, put, it, put the public in danger if he's released. And on balance, we feel that we have to protect the public. I don't think it was a very convincing argument at all. I mean, Stan was the last person to be a danger to the public uh, at that time. But anyway, uh, so the, the problem is that the courts are failing and therefore the question had been raised by both, how do we hold the courts accountable? I think that's a very good point and a good direction in which to think. Uh, further to that, and also to a question that Alok, no, not a, a, a Manas, I think, asked about, you know, uh, is the law defunct and what do we do when the government has a majority? You know, I think that the public still matters in India, all said and done. <laughs> public opinion matters and public pressure matters. And it's not like the government can get away with anything. I mean, the, the, the Modi government actually has made, has, has made quite a few U-turns in the last few years on a number of things. Uh, with a bit of luck, it could have even made a U-turn on the farm laws, although that didn't happen, but it could have happened. It made U-turns the, on the vaccination policy and so on. And furthermore, I don't know if Talpana would agree with me on that, but I think we have to remember that the laws are not only enforced by the state, they're enforced by social institu institutions. And that what people do uh, within a given legal system depends a lot on social norms and so on and expectations and public opinion. For example, the ease with which you can do a fake encounter would depend quite a bit on you know, the atmosphere in that region. And every time a fake encounter is exposed, I'm thinking particularly of Bastar here because I've been there recently. Uh, it makes it a bit more difficult for that to happen again. So, uh, so, so the fact that the government is a majority, I don't think it makes us completely powerless. And I think if there's a direction in which to go is to consolidate our own work. And in that context, I want to also remind you that there is a very active campaign now against UAPA in particular, and also for a better bail regime. And we should all join it and it is having an impact. I don't think that a few months ago, we would have possibly imagined that so many political parties, for example, would do a joint letter asking for the release of the PK-16. I mean, that was quite unimaginable not very long ago, and yet it has happened. And laws like UAPA, like POTA, for example, have been repealed earlier. So we should uh, not underestimate our, our strength, despite the fact that the times are really quite bleak. Kalpana, would you, yeah. Uh, on on the uh, destruction and manufacture of evidence, um, you know, I mean, on the manufacture of evidence, it is really uh, within completely within the writ of the court to take the government uh, to to account on that. Uh, why they don't? Why 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 courts don't do it? Uh, that's another question altogether that really uh, you know takes us back to the uh, worrying connections between what ought to be an independent judicial system and and the government and i actually don't see the police and government as separate i think they're part of the same thing uh, and 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 the police acts uh, you know as part of the government uh, and, and the government bears responsibility for the actions of the police. Uh, so both with the manufacture of evidence and with the destruction of evidence as well, it is well within the reach of the court 
to come down really heavily on the destruction of evidence because the destruction of evidence is also a criminal offense. And why is it that that doesn't happen? Why do we just have, uh, you know, a, a loosely structured, um, you know, very fuzzy uh, proclamation of distress, judicial distress? How can this happen? Would you have done this with your own daughter kind of thing? You know, that's not the point. The point is that there is a case that there has been a murder, that murder has been part of structural violence and assault. There, uh, there is a prescribed investigation under the Criminal Procedure Code, which ought to be followed. The investigation was not followed. The evidence has to be collected. There is an Indian Evidence Act. The evidence hasn't been collected. Why? You know, there, there has got to be uh, there has to be, uh, you know, a, commit, a judicial commitment to getting to the bottom of a particular case of atrocity. And if that is not happening consistently, and if, as Jean said with uh, Stan's case, the court is actually saying we are balancing his personal health against, again, this fuzzy concept of public interest. And then weighing in favor of the uh, fuzzy concept rather than in favor of clearly defined, uh, measurable, observable um, evidence of the person and his condition. And you, you also know that the evidence falls short. The lawyer has actually pointed out to you how the evidence is falling short. You don't counter the fact that the evidence is falling short, but you then half back to public interest. In Safura Zargar's case, if you play with embers and the embers go flying and then you are dealing with fire. You know, I mean, so these kinds of proclamations by the judiciary are in fact an act of equivocation. They are in fact a condoning of criminal offenses by investigating agencies and the police by the judiciary. Let's make no mistake about that. So there is, you know, we have, to, unless we begin to see questions as extensions of capital punishment or a kind of collaboration between entities that ought not under any circumstances to collaborate, we will never begin to make any headway in any of these cases. And I agree also that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the reason why courts are alert and we can, go but right back to the emergency and come right up to the present time. The reason why in the case of arbitrary arrest, detention, extrajudicial killings, encounters, the governments have actually been brought to account and investigating and policing agencies have actually been brought to account is because of public pressure. It is because in those cases, people have actually refused to be uh, calmed down by a repressive state. We can see what happened with the anti-CAA protests. We can see what happened with the December 2012 uh, rape case. We, you know, we can see all of that. And it is basically, you know, the, the, the turning point usually comes when there is uh, so much public pressure that it is impossible for the government, for even a repressive rogue government to continue functioning. And uh, we are at that turn now. I think in terms of mobilization, both are in against the CAA and the farm laws, but also against the U UAPA, the mobilization has been massive. The insistence on the constitution has been unprecedented. You know, we have not before the CAA, anti CAA protests, we have not actually witnessed the public performance of the constitution at protest sites. Yeah, so we, we are seeing a lot of very, uh, very different forms of public engagement with the constitution. And I think that that does enter courts, that does enter, I hope, judicial minds, and that that, that focus will be the tipping point eventually in bringing some semblance of justice into play. 
but on specific things in criminal law like evidence and destruction of evidence or manufacture of evidence it is just the lack of judicial diligence because there are provisions that makes space that takes specific note of each of these thank you so much um now there are a couple of questions in chat already and one raised hand there uh, uh, from ridu so i will uh, in the interest of time perhaps collect all three questions and uh, also bring alok into the discussion alok are you still there i hope you are um so uh, should i read the question uh, uh, in chat hi. out hi so should i read the question in chat out or shonita do you want to come on a uh, screen and read it yourself and ridu uh, would you like to go ahead and ask your question so mridu shonita and then there's another question on chat so okay uh, yeah. great again uh, thank you uh, everyone uh, for again three absolutely scintillating uh, presentations uh, i think i've picked a few ideas from from all three of you and and it's uh, forming into some kind of nebulous question but uh, you know from dr rai of course there was the idea of um, you know the idea that uh, the state still thinks uh, anomalous Uh, anomalously in a republic of uh, sovereign immunity which allows it uh, as to use your words murderous impunity is is very important i like the idea uh, that kalpana suggested that in fact what is required is a uh, public and political education uh, to somehow sort of shake that impunity to question it and i think jean also was speaking in in that uh, in that vein and uh, i'm delighted that there was optimism coming from this uh, but kalpana you spoke about a tipping point right and and i agree with you that there there have been more sort of civil protests out uh, overt civil protests um, over the last few months uh the pandemic has conveniently sort of allowed the state to disperse some of those uh but my concern uh is you know with uh with uh some kinds of uh should i call them issues that are that are so easily uh sort of um shunned from even public discussion barring a few exceptions like kashmir uh, i mean it's easy in the case of you you just have to say terrorist kashmir and uh Uh, a lot of otherwise concerned citizens uh, sort of see their interest uh, dissipating, or you throw the word Naxal out, and it has the same sort of effect of, of uh, you know, sort of dispersing interest. How in and, and you know that narrative, of course, has been produced over decades. Uh, this regime has uh, has taken it in slightly new directions. Uh, it itself has been associated with. producing some of that narrative uh, how how do you educate a uh, you know a, a public um, a civil society in which again barring a, a minority uh, most people actually uh, uh, do believe that you know the problem in kashmir is one of uh, the state of the secure uh, the, the security of the state uh, that many kashmiris in fact uh, are in fact uh, terrorists or sympathizers with terrorists uh in those circumstances where do you go about uh you know where do you begin educating uh actually even stoking an interest in exactly the issues that you know, uh, all of you have raised and and uh, Jean and Kalpana directly uh, about the terrifying sort of abuses uh of um of civil liberties human rights in Kashmir thank you thank you uh, mridu shonita do you want to so quickly we'll just take the three questions together shonita yeah uh, uh, go ahead and ask your question about cyber laws you're you're muted just um, unmute yourself thank you so much for that uh, fascinating and enriching discussion by all three panelists i just wanted to uh, ask a question on the cyber laws and it's a very generic question but i would like to just ask that uh can you uh, throw some light on the aspect of cyber laws when it comes to the using usage of fake news uh, as propaganda against the activists and uh, the idea of the mediation as to the false mediation that is going on through on several digital platforms and media houses um uh, in this age and you know how it is being used as a collective uh, sort of a um, collective effort who are using it 
yes there are some media houses who are checking the checking and checking the facts and presenting it but i would want to know that how can you how can we uh, create sort of and look at it through legally and use this um, uh, you know create an alternative voice against this collectively as public thank you so much shonita and there was a one line question in the chat box made some time ago i'm sorry to come to it so late from arup shen which simply asked how does the interpretation of law get connected with popular movements uh so so those are all the questions uh, that are there in the chat box and i don't see any other raised hands so if uh, if you would like to um go ahead and yes jean please uh, i i have to leave so i'll just make one very quick comment oh. on this question of uh, how do you get people to uh, to think and talk about kashmir because that's a very important thing i don't think the problem will ever be resolved unless the indian public thinks and talks about kashmir and it can be done i mean we can uh, initiate public discussions and i think the most important thing is to listen to kashmiris that is the one thing that can move people i think that is how i was moved i, I spent 20 years in india from 1979 without asking myself any questions about kashmir because at that time it was a taboo subject you could just couldn't talk about it and then suddenly in a conference of the uh, indian association of women studies or something in bhubaneswar i heard a kashmiri woman talk about a situation there and it was a revelation then i went to kashmir that was a further revelation that can happen to a lot of people so i think some people have to take the initiative organize the base invite kashmiris and uh, slowly hopefully things will change it's a long it's a long road because we most people in india don't have a clue what's going on in kashmir so it's a long way but i think some start has to be made on the cyber laws is way beyond me <laughs> i think it's a very complex subject but i think there is some work being done on this in some countries that we can take inspiration from uh yeah, right now we feel quite powerless we feel that we can we have no control over these technological giants and that our privacy has now been Uh, surrendered forever but it, i don't think it has to be like that the same technology that's used to invade our privacy privacy can be used to protect our privacy and uh, there are legal protections that can be put in place in particular for the right to privacy so i think we should try to take inspiration from good work that has been done elsewhere put our own heads together and uh, try to put protection protections in place now i have to leave i'm very sorry but i really enjoyed this occasion and thank you very much for inviting me thank you for making the time thank you jam Uh, Alok, would you like to come in uh, and answer any of the questions? Three I'm questions. Not, uh, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I mean, I. I, I hear Mujib's question, and I'm. I mean, I share that despair. That. That. I mean, this. This whole sort of uh, right-wing common sense is so well established that one doesn't know where one can begin to get a handle on it, and. Uh, God knows, I've also, you know, tried, you know, the, the, as it were, facts, Kashmir history, look at it, da da da, and what hits a blank wall? There's, there's nothing there, and I'm just, I was just wondering, I was noting down to myself, you know, on, on how whether this very well established narrative, where, as it were, ammunition can be picked off at will. So you, if you think you could counter this one, there's something else that is, that is brought in. you know so whether whether one can confront the problem of right wing common sense sanghi common sense directly or by seeking to create an alternative common sense so that you know what in some sense seeks to bypass it rather than confront it because in confronting it one fights on their terrain you know it's, it's not just the right wing it's as you said uh, mm. you know there, there's a bigger problem there yeah, yeah. you know uh, to use your term i mean you know the ancillary sectors of civil society are also rotten yeah. uh, you know and it predates uh, the bjp the bjp just mm. took uh, you know impunity in kashmir in in a, in a different direction uh, i also you know struck by what you said i mean the reason why police reforms are uh, have not occurred is because it's a colonial police perhaps that relationship between the state and civil society in india is also 
sadly colonial, right? Um, uh, I mean, you know, so therefore the despair is really where will that accountability come from? I mean, barring, you know, a few people, of course, they're, they're very, very brave people who are, you know, who are battling this, but until civil society, uh, you know, wider sector of civil society begins, as Kalpana was saying, you know, it can, can be sort of woken up and provoked into saying, look, I mean, this matters to all of you. Uh, whether it's Kashmir or you know um, uh, the UAPA laws, uh, or as you know, uh, Professor Guha Thakurta said, I mean, Siddiq Kappan should matter to everyone, not just. Uh, you know. uh, but perhaps it's that relationship that is still colonial. I mean, it's it's this regime certainly does love the idea of sovereign immunity. Uh, so, sorry, thank you very much for that. I didn't mean to prolong the discussion. Sorry, thank you for your question. Uh, does anybody want to answer Shonita on cyber law? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm way out of range. Yeah. 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 I, I uh, don't know anything about cyber laws. But of course, about fake news, yes. And fake news, uh, you know, any court, any, any uh, court that uh, is hearing a case, uh, where fake news has resulted in wrongs or in offenses uh, can actually rule against it or can rule against the entities spreading fake news. There's nothing uh, preventing them from doing that. But the fact is that they don't do it. Or judges who do it are transferred immediately, like we saw in the case of Justice Murlidhar. Yeah. So, yeah, but cyber laws, I'm sorry, I just don't know anything about it. So um, if there are no further questions, are there any other questions? You can still come in. Um, Parthuda, I have, are you there? I have not I seen you at all. all, all. Uh, yeah, he's, I can see the name there. So maybe he is there, but he hasn't come into the discussion yet. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Doipan, uh, no? So then in that case, if there are no further questions, I will uh, bring the session to an end. Thank you very much for the amount of time you've given. It's almost 6.30 in the evening now. Uh, we began at four o'clock. Um, one of the uh, sort of um, terrible things about these virtual platforms is that one doesn't even get to have a cup of tea <laughs> afterwards. There is no uh, sort of opportunity to exchange a few words. Uh, we will look forward to having you perhaps physically with us uh, when life becomes normal again, if it ever does. But uh, we, we, we hope that it will. And we hope that you will um, either drop by when you're in Calcutta and uh, physically anywhere near the center. But otherwise, of course, also, if we have the opportunity to um, invite you to come and speak to us, we will, we will certainly um, take advantage of the acquaintance we've made with each other or renewed acquaintance in some of your cases. Uh, so thank you again for your time. Thank you to everybody else for coming and, and uh, listening and being with us here today. Um, I think that was a really productive, uh, wonderful uh, session. The 10th Anjun Ghosh Memorial Seminar uh, has been a success, I think. So thank you again uh, for your time. And with that, I will end the thank meeting.